Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about BDD, which is Behavior Driven Development. I guess before I get started, I'm just curious if you could raise your hand if you've heard of BDD or you've used it in any way. So cool. OK, there's actually a lot of people here. Great. <laughs> so if you have questions, ask all these people. Um, but I guess kind of like building off from what Jim was just saying, I think BDD is a different mindset that you could think about as well. Um, I'll kind of explain a little bit about what it is. So, so basically, behavior-driven development is, a, is this collaborative software development process. You can think about it from the perspective of you're not just building code, you're not just building software, but you're building solutions, things for your clients. And basically, the way that it works is you have what's called a three amigos approach. So it's with your, your software engineers, all of you, um, your quality assurance experts, so your QA team, and your business counterparts. These are your product managers, your product owners, and whatnot. And the value here is you're taking in all these important perspectives to understand what does our client want, what does the workflows our clients do, and how do we build that into our system. So that's a really important aspect of, of BDD. And with BDD, the intention is you're taking these custom requirements and you're putting it front and center of your software development process. So basically, you're able to, to think about what is our client trying to solve and then take it into how we, how we should build the code. So an important part of BDD is that it's not about test coverage, right? It's not about seeing how many lines of code you have that's being covered by tests. It's about really ensuring what is the behavior that we expect in our systems. So a uh, hypothetical story here, you know, you have your, your engineers and you have your product owners, and they come to you and they're like, hey, I need to build some software. I need to build some software to paint this building blue. And you're like, okay, easy, I can do that. So you build the software, you know, you have your software, you know, measure the height of the building. It can determine the, the pigmentation to get that perfect hue of blue. And it's great. Everyone's happy. And you build some tests. You know, you want to validate your software does what you expect it to do. Um, and you've, you've validated everything looks great. Deploy it out. And then your customer comes back to you. It's like, wait a minute. Didn't I tell you to paint the building green? So you, you built the software, right? It works as you expect it to work, but it's not actually solving the needs for clients. So that's where BDD comes in. It's important to bring that forward. Um, BDD allows you to prevent this, this mis misunderstanding by aligning all of those requirements and expectations earlier in the process. It also gives you this shared language and this structure to allow everyone, technical or not, to have clear visibility and understanding of the project's progress and also have living documentation of how the system works and the behaviors that we expect for our system. So, BDD is basically, uh, basically three phases. Um, the first phase is called discovery. This is basically where you have your three amigos. They come together and discuss, you know, what are you trying to build? What is this product? What is this feature? What are you trying to do? And they come to some sort of agreements of, of what you want to build. You know, some teams and companies might call this, you know, business planning, requirements gathering. So it's kind of a similar concept. You know, you're trying to evaluate what the customer wants, and you have those requirements uh, listed out and, and ready to go. Then you take those requirements and you formulate them. You know, you put them in some sort of scenario, some sort of uh, structured language. Um, the most common one used is called Gherkin, and I'll share an example about what that looks like later. But basically, you kind of take this shared language to make sure everyone's on the same page about what we're building, what are the workflows we're trying to achieve. And this is an important aspect of BDD. You know, uh, the, I've watched this video. The, the founder of BDD, Dan North, basically says the most common problems teams face is miscommunication. So I think this is a really, really important aspect of BDD, of how do we make sure we don't have any miscommunication, everyone has that shared language that we understand. And then the third part is automation. So automation is when you take those scenarios, you take those behaviors, those expectations, and you feed it into a testing framework so you can actually validate that your software is doing what you expect. An important aspect of this as well is it's not just validating your software does what you expect, but also validating it over a period of time, right? That's why we automate these things. Um, so that as we make code changes and whatnot, the behaviors that we agreed upon for these past features are still happening in our system today. And another part about BDD that's really important is that it doesn't end at automation, right? It's a cyclical process of as you're building new features, as you're discovering new workflows that our clients are doing, how do you revisit, okay, is there new behaviors I didn't count for? How do we build that into our system? What makes sense? And kind of continuing to, to, to re uh, reinforce and then validate your software is working as expected. So I like to think about these three phases from the perspective of these three questions, these questions that I ask myself when I, when I build new, new software, think about coding. I think about the discovery phase as what it can do. You know, what are you trying to build? What is the, what is the opportunity there for your software? Formulation is what it should do. You know, you've kind of agreed about what you want to build, but what is it supposed to do? And then automation is what it actually does. So making sure that you actually have understanding of what your software is doing.
So for today, I'm going to kind of focus on this automation phase. Um, I want to share a little bit about how at Bloomberg, we've kind of built a layer on top of this automation phase, because it's, again, not just about being able to validate your system where it's expected, but a lot of our teams at Bloomberg are dealing with, you know, lots of money, lots of trades. And so as a result of that, we, we deal with a lot of distributed systems, and these are across different teams. So a lot of shared ownership across end-to-end -end client workflows. So this is an important aspect for us that we built out to make sure it's not just about validating our software where it's expected, but also how do we make sure we have clear ownership for each part of that pipeline. So a little bit myself. Uh, so my name is Jackie. Uh, I've been at Bloomberg for about five and a half years. I started off at Bloomberg as a software engineer, and I moved into a team lead role last year. Uh, I work. For, uh, the team that I lead is the post-trade trade automation team within our buy-side order management system. So I know a lot of financial terms, but basically what we do is we build software to automate workflows for clients. Uh, and that's important because we're the entry point for all of these operations that happen in the post-trade world. And so as you'll see later, this is why it's so near and dear to my heart is because when we think about that ownership in that pipeline, my team starts at that very beginning. So it's important for us to make sure that it is really clear in that pipeline which team is responsible for which services. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the team that I work on is, is one team within a, a span, a web of distributed systems and distributed teams. And so that's why it's really important that we use BDD. And I know we're at a software engineering conference, but I want to give a little bit of a financial services 101 just to kind of provide some context into why BDD is so important for us. So for those of you who don't know what a buy-side order management system is, which maybe is the most of you, <laughs> I didn't know about it when I first started at Bloomberg for sure. Um, but basically, you can think about it as a software and a system that manages the entire life cycle of a trade. So in a very, very simplistic view, what it could look like is you might have in order, you know, someone might come in and say, I want to buy 100 shares of Google at this price. And then given that order, I need to validate, okay, does it pass all the sanctions, the compliance, the regulations for my region? And if it does, how do I allocate it? You know, I have a couple of accounts. I want to make sure that these accounts have these securities and these accounts have those securities. And how do I uh, triage that between those accounts? And then finally, post-trade. This is the area that my team lives in. And basically, post-trade on, on a high level is when you commit for a trade to happen, all the steps that need to happen to make sure it successfully happens. So what that means is, you know, you might, as I mentioned earlier, you might have an order where I want to buy 100 shares of Google. So how do I make sure that my counterparty is in agreement with me? How do I make sure the money is actually transacting between parties? So all those operations are considered post-trade. So I'm going to focus on post-trade. And... At Bloomberg, you know, the post-trade organization, we have over 50, 50 plus engineers. So I think it's another really important aspect of BDD is that it's not just cross departments, but it's also cross teams within engineering. And this is really important. We kind of build out that end-to-end -end client workflow is making sure that what I agree should happen for the client is the same as what my downstream teams are agreeing to as well. So I want to take a little example of a post-trade workflow and just drill down to what our architecture looks like and why it's so important why we use BDD. So an example of a post-trade workflow is something like this. You know, I might, have, um, I might have a need to send a trade out to a third-party system. And in this case, I listed Swift. So Swift is basically, um, it's, a, it's a network that banks and financial institutions are part of that allows you to send securely messages around trades, uh, trade information. Um, to settle. So this is all important around the idea of being able to, again, transact that money between parties. And under the hood of what's happening here, there are many, many teams involved. There's many, many services involved. But our client doesn't care, right? Our client just wants to make sure that this happens correctly. They don't really care what the organizational, organizational boundaries look like under the hood. They don't care about which architecture I'm using. Maybe we have one team that has one monolithic service or many teams that have microservices. The client doesn't care. They just want to make sure that our software works as expected and that it's reliable over a period of time. But, you know, since we're engineers, under the hood, what's really happening is I actually have multiple teams. And there's, this is, a, again, a very simplified view. There's actually many more teams, many, many, many more services involved here. But on a high level, you're seeing that under the hood for one client workflow, there's so many components on the engineering side that needs to be validated. And if we look into one of these components, you know, we can validate that that component works correctly. But BDD is where it comes in to validate that the client's expectation across all our services are working as expected. So, uh, so I guess um, another thing I want to mention, uh, I know we're at ACCU, so, so probably everyone's hearing a lot of stuff about C and C++. So a lot of our services are, are written in C, uh, C and C++. 
pretty much for performance, low latency issues, or needs. Um, but actually, we use Python to test our end-to-end -end workflows. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Python. I know uh, it's a little bit different from what you're hearing about these last couple of days. But the reason why we use Python is because Python gives a lot of tools out of the box that make it really easy to kind of build those building blocks to test that end-to-end -end client workflow. So the thing that our team uses is called Behave. Um, this is one example of a framework you can use at BDD. There's also Cucumber and many, many others. But with Behave, what it gives you outside of the box, it gives you these two layers. So the first layer it gives you is ability to write behavior scenarios. So these are also called specifications by examples. And in Behave, they're written in what's called feature files. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when you talk about that client workflow, this is how you're going to write it. You can almost think about it as documentation. How am I listing that business requirement? And on the other hand, I also have what's called steps, behave steps. And these are the implementation definitions for each aspect of that scenario. And I'll show you an example of what it looks like. But with both of these, uh, typically they're, they're written in a shared language. And again, I mentioned earlier that the most common used one that interests you today is called Gherkin. So what is Gherkin? So Gherkin is basically, this is an example of what a Gherkin syntax looks like. It mainly uses these three keywords, given, when, and then. And that allows us to have a clear structure and how we're writing behaviors so that everyone understands whether you're an engineer, you're in QA, or you're in product. So just very briefly, uh, given basically refers to the initial context, the, the setup that I need for the scenario. What is the, the preconditions that need to be classified or qualified before I can even validate a new behavior. When, very straightforward, this is the, the actual trigger, the action that I'm validating, the behavior itself that I want to confirm uh, the expectation within the scenario. And then, then you can probably guess this, uh, this is the expected outcome. Given that precondition, given the, um, the action itself, what do I want to happen from the client's perspective? So you'll notice here, I didn't use any technical terms. You know, it's just about baking a croissant, pretty easy. I didn't mention any service names. I didn't mention any databases. I actually didn't even mention the word test. And that's really, really important, right? I think it's an important mindset that we have to be in when we do development. It's not about just testing our code, but again, validating behavior, the expectations that our clients have for our systems. And I also want to mention here that the important part about specifications is that it's about what will happen and not how it happens. So again, tying back to nothing technical here, nothing that you're seeing here that is specific to programmers or developers or whatnot. So I take this back to my other example. You know, I was talking about that trade being sent out to Swift. So this is what it looks like, you know? It's very, very straightforward. It pretty much looks the exact same. I just changed out Raspberry Jam to Swift. It could be whatever. Um, and I want to drill down specifically into what a behave step looks like. It's very straightforward. It's just a Python function, you know? Um, I've definitely uh, taken a lot of the business logic out, you know, kind of keep some secrets from the Bloomberg software perspective. Mm -hmm. But basically, you know, there's going to be some code here to call some sort of services, do some sort of database request, whatever the case is. But all of that is hidden under what I have um, in terms of my decorator. Um, and here I just use the at as just a, uh, a syntactic sugar for how you write decorators. But basically, decorators, if you're not familiar, it's just a way of extending the functionality of your function without modifying it itself. And it's really valuable because you can actually reuse them across multiple functions. So it allows you to really scale and have that usability across multiple scenarios. And this is where we were able to really benefit from in terms of that automation layer that I mentioned earlier. So what we did is we actually built out some custom decorators. And you can do this for a lot of things. I know different teams at Bloomberg also use this for Jira integration and other things. Um, but the value that we had here is we were able to say for the specific step in this entire scenario, this is the team that's responsible. And that allowed us to kind of build a little bit more intelligence into our infrastructure so that if something did happen, we had a very clear first team to go to to ask certain questions to. So how does this kind of look inside the example I had earlier? So, so basically in this example, and this is, this is quite true in, our, in a simplistic view of what's happening today for our systems, but basically we'll have a team um, that's responsible for kind of getting that data. Maybe they're picking it off some sort of queue or, or message system. And, and once they get that, they're going to pass it on to another queue, to another service. And maybe that service is responsible for building the message to send it out to the Swift system. And then maybe lastly, we'll have a database where something is writing to that database saying, okay, this is the status of, of that transaction of what's happened for that workflow. 
So under the hood, maybe they're owned by different teams. And this is, uh, this is the reason why BDD, again, is really important, is we're kind of taking away the, 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 the granularity of seeing, OK, who's testing each component. But we're still baking it in some capacity so we can validate that every part of the pipeline is working as expected. So what do you think is happening here when, uh, when everything passes, everyone's happy, you know? Everyone's friends with each other. Everything is great, rainbows and sunshines. The problem is when something fails. And I'm going to bring this back also, even talking to what Jim was saying earlier about the debugging mindset, you know? And my team, we, we sit at that very early phase of that workflow. So we don't want to be in the business of just debugging every single day, right? That's probably not the most fun thing that we can do as engineers. So it's important that we're kind of building into some sort of automation of which team is responsible for which aspect of the workflow. So if for some reason the scenario fails, this behavior is not working as we expect it to work, who should be the team to kind of first look into it and figure out what's going on with their system? So to kind of just quickly tie this back to what I was saying earlier, uh, we might have a system like this. And, and maybe let's say for some reason we're not able to get the status. Maybe we couldn't parse it, we couldn't decode it, um, or maybe the database was down. Whatever the reason is, something went wrong at that step. And so the team that probably knows the most about what's going wrong is Team C. So because we built this in, we were able to kind of notify them immediately and be like, hey, look at this behavior, look into your part of this workflow so we can figure out why this end-to-end -end client experience isn't working as expected. So I want to get back to kind of that client workflow I explained earlier, and I kind of want to touch upon end-to-end -to -end testing, because I think this is also really, really important, and it's something that we can benefit from with BDD. Um, I think with BDD, uh, it's, it's about building out, you know, each aspect of the workflow and kind of tying it in together. That's kind of like the common theme that you're hearing about BDD. And actually, the cardinal rule of BDD is one behavior, one scenario. So you might be asking, okay, if that's true, then you're probably building out all these different uh, test cases and scenarios for every behavior, but how is it validating the client's end-to-end -end workflow? And I should before, you know, an example of just specifically one step in that workflow. So again, how do we kind of take that and chain everything together? So I just put together like a very, obviously it's not detailed, very abstracted view of what an end-to-end -end client workflow can look like. And just tying this back earlier to what I was saying around feature files, this is how we can kind of group scenarios together and build that end-to-end -end client validation. And the way that you would be able to build this out is the, the then of your previous scenario kind of feeds into as the given of the next scenario. So you can kind of see that chain together. And again, by being able to leverage that automation aspect, you are able to find out, okay, if this specific behavior is failing, which team is responsible? And maybe it's not related to the other behaviors inside this one client end-to-end -end workflow. So I kind of want to just like, share some quick takeaways as summaries, kind of what I was talking about before earlier. Um, I think an important part of BDD is to remember it's not about building tests, right? I mean, we can do that. It's great. Everything, everyone's happy. But it's really about making sure how do we pull in different perspectives of what our client wants and how do we build that into a process. I touched upon the automation phase in BDD, but the other two phases are equally, if not more important, in BDD as well. So it is important to kind of think about this as a process. How do we reshape how we're doing the software development lifecycle to incorporate our client's workflows and expectations as part of it? I think one important thing here as well to think about is as engineers, like we know what our code is doing. And we know if we think our code is working as expected, but sometimes what we think our code is doing or we think our code should be doing isn't really the thing that our code should be doing, isn't really the thing that our client wants our code to be doing. So I think it's an important mindset to kind of think about when we think about BDD. And the other part um, is just kind of, you know, as engineers, we just want to be as most efficient as possible. And I think when we think about testing, um, I remember when I, when I first started uh, as a software engineer, testing would take sometimes longer than building features themselves. And you know, if you think about the different levels of testing, right? Unit testing, uh, component testing, uh, system testing, integration testing, there's, there's so many different things you can test. And probably if you think about the arch of how, how much tests you can include, you're probably never gonna hit 100% of test coverage. So I think it's important to think about how do we kind of reuse different things, different aspects to allow us to get as close to what we think is the most confident level of testing that we want. Um, and that's why kind of why we use BDD here as well. Cool. And I guess with that, any questions, if I have time? Great. I guess everyone learned about BDD. <laughs>